Paul. It's uh, March 6th. This is the regular meeting of the Birmingham Advisory Parking Committee. Uh, Laura, would you be so kind as to take the roll? Um, right. Here. Here. Richard Dexter. Here. Kevin Kozlowski. Here. Michelle Moody. Here. Lisa Silverman. Here. Mary Claire Parkoff. Here. Okay. Looks like we're all here. Nice. Um, first agenda item is the approval of the minutes of March 2024. Uh, I assume everybody's read them. Uh, would anybody like to uh, add any clarification, additions, corrections, detail, anything else? It's, um, motion to approve. Hearing none. Uh, hear a motion from Richard to approve. Do we have a second? Second. Second from Kevin. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes. All right. So we're here for EV charging. Um, so, Aaron, uh, we've got some proposals here. We, we don't have any, uh, you know, background or introduction or anything, so. Yeah, I can give. Uh, we need, we need can, to know why we have these proposals here. Yep. So, obviously, um, electric vehicles are becoming more popular, more mainstream in today's society. Um, obviously, most automotive companies are now making their own version of EV vehicles. Um, in an effort to continue to be proactive and um, become more green or be, participate in the green movement um, and assist the community in transition to EVs, uh, city staff were proposing to install 20 EV charging units on city property, 10 in the Shane Park lot, otherwise known as Lot 7, and another 10 in the Chester Street parking garage. Um, the intent is to provide EV charging as an amenity to make the city's parking facilities more attractive and available to those people who have EVs. Um, so city, uh, staff submitted an invitation to bid for design, build, operate, and maintain of self-service electrical vehicle stations um, at those two city locations. Um, we were looking for EV charging stations that would involve minimal cost to the city and where the city would not be responsible for maintaining and servicing the equipment. Um, because EV charging is so new and the technology is evolving so quickly, um, we did not want to install, own, and operate the EV chargers ourselves. We wanted that to be the responsibility of somebody else. Um, so we, um, sorry, um, therefore we submitted an invitation to bid seeking bidders who would design, build, operate the EVs uh, using a revenue share model, meaning that they would own the equipment, they would install it, they would be on the hook for all the capital portions of all the costs of the EVs, and then they would collect all the revenue and then give the city a portion of that revenue. Um, while, while the bidders are responsible for, for all that, um, Sorry. Um, during the mandatory pre-bid walk, it was determined that both the Shane Park lot and the Chester Street garage would require new DTE transformers to be installed in order to support the EV charging. Um, we had been in contact with DTE to make the, the necessary upgrades. However, DTE has communicated to us that for these upgrades to be made to both locations, the city actually needs to select an EV charging vendor um, because DTE needs to work with that vendor to make the necessary upgrades. So we couldn't bring both facilities up to the necessary levels um, first before selecting it. We had to select the vendor first. Where in the Chester Street garage are they proposed to be? So as part of the package, we basically were leaving it up to the vendors to see where they would recommend it. Um, we did not specifically tell them where they wanted. We wanted them to tell us where they thought they should put them. And how many are there? Uh, ten in the Chester Street garage. So is that ten uh, chargers or ten parking ten. spaces? Ten parking spaces, so okay. ten ports. Whoa. Okay. It's, all right, we can talk about it after. Right. Um, That's a good question. 
So staff also requested in the scope of work of the invitation to bid that their proposed charging stations must have the ability to provide a, uh, have an API interface that would interact with the city's parking enforcement system. Um, so uh, basically parking enforcement officers would be notified when somebody's charger had basically, you know, they had reached their max charge and left their vehicle all there all day so they could write a ticket. Um, they also requested that they would interface with our parking meters and park mobile. So in theory, if uh, at the parking meter locations, if somebody wanted to pay for their EV charging and their parking space in one transaction, that that was feasible. Um, finally, the city also included in the scope of desire to enter into a revenue sharing model as, as discussed. Each bidder shall be responsible for all of the costs associated with the development of the EV charging station infrastructure and should collect the revenue um, of the EV, EV services um, and give the city a percentage of that revenue. So when we went out to, uh, when we had our pre-bid walk, there were six companies who um, walked around um, during the mandatory pre-bid meeting. Um, of the six, only three actually provided bids. Um, Blink charging, EV mode, and OB power. Um, EV mode only submit, so I guess of the three bidders, um, all three bidders had issues with their prospective proposals. Uh, Blink was unsure whether or not their product could interface with the city's parking systems, meaning Park Mobile and the parking enforcement system. Um, therefore, they did not sign the contract uh, that was uh, contained in the invitation to bid. EV mode did not present a revenue share model, um, uh, but they did, it, um, well, they did not provide a revenue share model that did not involve substantial interaction with the city, um, city staff. And OB Power also did not submit a signed contract as part of their proposal. Uh, OB Power had questions concerning the language of the city's contract and the length of term. Um, those were their main sticking points. And in sum, all three bidders did not submit proposals that met the city's specified criteria for this project as outlined in the invitation to bid. Uh, I guess a little bit of summary about what we feel about each of these, uh, each of the bids. EV mode, um, they only submitted two references. Uh, one of the references was a small workplace here in Madison Heights, um, and of that, the chargers that they had there, they were for staff working in their building and was not a public charging, um, was not public facing, meaning it was not open to the general public. They didn't charge people. So it was just a charger that their employees, when they came to work, could just plug in free of charge. Yeah, I noticed that. Um, the other vendor uh, we were not able to get a hold of and was in California. Uh, OB Power responded with questions regarding the agreement, but did not provide an executed agreement. Uh, their propo they proposed to use charge point chargers, which are currently the most popular EV charging network in the United States. OB Power also had extensive experience installing chargers and provided strong references. However, OB Power's revenue share model consisted of reimbursing the city for electric chargers um, by submitting copies of our DTE, our bills from DTE for reimbursement, and then also a 20% uh, revenue share of sponsorship or advertising. And allowing advertising and sponsorship is not something that city staff feels that the city should be involved in at this point in time. And then last uh, was Blink. Blink, we thought, was probably the strongest of the three bids. Um, they had their own hardware, both pedestal mount, wall mount. Um, they had dual and single chargers, an app for customers to use. To use. Um, Blink also integrates with third-party apps such as PlugShares and other providers out there. Um, and they also had a dashboard or a portal for city staff to use to get metrics like you know about the usage of the equipment um, that we could use, that we could share with others uh, blink also provided a revenue share model of five percent with the city however um, when the city contacted the three references uh, that the link provided we got uh, negative feedback from two of the three um, so one was the city of uh, Phoenix, Arizona, 
of which their complaints basically revolved around, um, well, I should say all the complaints, both Phoenix, Arizona, and Chicago, most of their complaints revolved around the lack of response time when there are issues at using the devices. Um, speaking with Blink, they kind of say that they, they guarantee a 48-hour window of response time. However, that's response, not necessarily resolving the issue. Um, speaking with um, both the city of Chicago and city of Phoenix, um, it, those issues did not get resolved within 40 hours, sometimes weeks, off, sometimes months. Um, the most, the one where we had the positive feedback was an airport, um, but they had just installed the Blink chargers at the end of 2023, so they really have not been in the ground for very long. What about OBE's references? They had good references, but again, the revenue share model was not something the city was yeah. willing to to consider at this point in time. And Blink said they they said twice that they'd be willing to negotiate a higher amount. It's like they were asking us to offer a higher amount. Yeah, and Blink, as you saw in their proposal, they have um, they have different rates. So if you're a Blink member, there's one rate. If you're a non-Blink member, there's another rate. Does it cost money to be a member? No, it does not. It just costs money if you're not a member. Right. More mm -hmm. money. <clears throat> do we have to do this? It doesn't sound like we have any good vendors. <laughs> Well, and that's what we wanted to bring to the committee today. Obviously, we didn't provide this this summary to you. Um, we were still in the process of doing some of these reference checks, but um, at this point in time, I, we agree with, I guess, that comment right there. We do not feel that the three, any of these three um, vendors really are providing a solution that the city is comfortable with pursuing at this time. Do we have any sense of why the other vendors didn't? Respond was it like too small a project for them? They didn't like the revenue sharing model. Was there some barrier for them? Or? We haven't gotten a response back yet, um, but we have reached out to see if we can get some feedback. What were the other vendors' names? So one of them was Red E. Um, they have done some work locally. They are a local company, <clears throat> but they've done work with the city of Detroit, Plymouth. Um, and some other local communities. Another one was State Electric, which um, State Electric is partnered with Flow is the actual charging. So State Electric is the electric company and it's part of a GM dealership uh, sponsorship committee thing. So basically they would come in with this revenue share model. Um, they would install a sign that says, you know, these chargers brought to you by GM dealership, which is, um, something again that the city is not uh, follows the lines of the sponsorship agreement, um, and the other one was I'm trying to remember now. Um, I think it was EV Go. Yeah, yeah that's the biggest network. But but these were the only three that actually responded to the invitation to bid. What about ChargePoint? Nothing. ChargePoint, uh, that was OB Power, but when we spoke to ChargePoint directly, ChargePoint doesn't do revenue share, so it had to be somebody who was willing to, um, I guess, I guess, uh, how would I want to say it, perform, you know, on ChargePoint's behalf, per, do the revenue share model, which is what OB Power was willing to do, but ChargePoint themselves directly does not get into revenue share models, so you just have to buy them and install them. If you want to see a charge point application and talk to somebody about it and just see who they're directly dealing with, Birmingham Place has six of them in the basement, and they'd be willing to talk to you, or at least I'm offering them right, right now. But That's good to yeah. They're on the record offering them. Okay. But uh, they do have them in their basement. I've used them. And uh, it seemed to be working, but I think the the issue that we're all talking about too is the reliability, customer service, maintenance, and in this depleting EV uh, usage uptake, we could be, you know, there there could be some issues where we've got this infrastructure here and we can't 
provide service so that we, as a city, even though it's our hands are tied and we don't have control over it, we could really look bad on it, you know, from a public relations standpoint. So, I mean, I totally agree with you. It's risky right now. we got to do some more research and understanding, especially in, in these times of um, reduced usage. There still is, you know, that 7% uptake, and they're talking about how, you know, we're going to have a higher a higher population of EVs, but it's coming a lot slower, and we all know that. We read it every day. What was the length of the contract you were looking for? <clears throat> um, the length of the contract was five years with all. Well, that's more than reasonable. One of the reasons we obviously wanted to work on this for quite a while, and Nick Dupuis is here from the planning department because he helped us. He's in charge of the city sustainability committee as well. I mean, obviously, this is a green initiative on behalf of the city, so we involved Nick. We sat down and he went over all the proposals with us as well, as well as sharing it with some other members of the city staff that were involved in that movement. So we did, it was kind of a collaborative effort between the three of us and then the rest of some other staff members to get that. But one of the things that we wanted to accomplish today is one, let you know what, what we had done with it. And B, if there's anything else you think as a board that we now, we kind of think we need to go back to the drawing board and maybe do some research as to really what what other people are doing some other places and see if we have it has a working model that we can either mimic or no one's sense of reinventing the wheel. If someone's got something that works, then, but we wanted to see if there's anything else that the board wanted to us to investigate or look at or, you know, uh, investigate along with the process of what we're doing. Yeah, you've got to get out to other cities somehow locally. I mean, even if it's, I would think Ann Arbor has something going on. To Ann Arbor has a lot. They're actually right. very aggressive. Go to school. Yeah. yeah. With the, the one thing with Ann Arbor, because they actually, um, so we are participants of SEMCOG, the Southeast Michigan Council of Governments, and they have our, um, EV charging and just EV, the EV initiative is a huge portion of what they um, participate in. And Ann Arbor is a huge participant in that. The one thing I found with Ann Arbor is, is they is what? might get some grants, but they own all theirs. Oh. Well, the, right. Not Which I'm not saying it's good or bad. It. Right. It's yeah. the model you got to evaluate. Yeah. Good or bad. So I th oh, go ahead. Sorry. No. Nope. Oh, I was going to say. Um, I think it might also be worth revisiting the locations. I know that uh, Michelle had pointed out that putting the chargers outdoors um, adds a lot of stress to them and can increase a lot of the maintenance burdens. And it sounds like, from things that I've read, and it sounds like things that that people have heard, um, reliability is a huge issue with EV chargers right now. Um, so it might be a better idea to put all of them in garages so that they're covered and out of the elements to begin with. Um, in Chester, I feel like I'm on the fence about my fear with Chester is if we put them in Chester and they're at like, you know, middling utilization, well, Chester's at middling utilization. So it's going to be hard for us to tell, does this mean well, we shouldn't put EV chargers in the other garages because people don't want them, or does it just mean, well, not that many people park in Chester, so it's not surprising that the, the utilization of the, of the EV chargers is low. Right? If we, if we put them, I know maybe this is also a bad idea for different reasons, but if we put them in busier garages, we could at least be confident that if they're only getting half used, that's as good as they're going to get because the garage is filling up. Um, whereas if you put them in Chester and you only get a handful of users, well, maybe that's because the demand is low. Maybe that's because just not that many people park in Chester. You could also put, um, don't have to put as many, you know, you could split them up, you know, put mm -hmm. two, two, and two, and two, you know, or three and three in different garages. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the issue you don't have is to the put infrastructure. A, you know, a whole bank of them in the one garage and say that's it. And public perception. Well, and if we're, yeah, the issue there might be if we're doing all this like transformer work and we've got to do oh, all true. these upgrades yeah. at each location, that's going to get painful. That's going to be. We bad. also um, consider the fact that maybe, you know, being the least utilized of the structures, Chester, that maybe this would be a drawing card mm -hmm. that others would say, oh, Chester's got EV stations, so maybe we could draw people that may park on other parking decks yeah. to Chester as a way to increase. Uh, utilization and make it a drawing card for the yeah for the no that's so. definitely also possible yeah, yeah th that was that was indeed one of the reasons why um, 
that that was one reason. The other reason why is we knew this was the next garage that was going to have the repairs, so the infrastructure, the electrical infrastructure was going to be made. So from a timing standpoint, it seemed like that could be maybe coincide with our desire to install these with the upgrade to the electrical infrastructure. We chose lot seven just because we wanted to get some place that was outside, like a metered location. Um, and because that was a surface lot, you know, it's unique, the fact that it's a surface lot, but it still has meters in it. Um, but that it's centrally located, and then the time zone at that location was a longer time zone. So it's a four hour time zone in that lot. So if you were somebody looking to stay at a meter, there's not a whole lot of incentive to pay to do an EV meter in a one hour or a two hour time zone, but a four hour time zone, you can make the argument that, hey, it might be worth plugging in for a little bit. Do you have a relationship with anybody at DTE, like real strong, that, that's working with you on this? Because they've got, you know, EV charging specialists out there and they've put in, you know, several systems. Do you have a relationship with anybody there? The city does, yeah. I mean, okay. there's, so there's, there are con key. the city's has a contact that they have a relationship with. And then they have, DTE also has their EV charging forward right. um, team that we're also consulting with. Okay, because that's critical. They, they're seeing all these installs and all the issues. Yeah. What, so what? they can guide you to some... Correct. Yeah. Yeah. One, one point I wanted to bring up earlier, but the conversation kind of got away from it. Um, I noticed that Blink did a project um, at the GM Tech Center. Did you guys uh, get in touch with them at all? We did not, no. They didn't provide them as a reference. We've asked them to provide us some context of well, locations in Michigan. It's a um, Motor City experience in the Blink yeah. proposal. Um, no, we did not contact yeah. them. I just, yeah, there, We've asked them for other locations specifically in Michigan yeah. that we could reach out. Um, but the other thing is we also were asking about people that had uh, a similar revenue share model as well. Right. Um, the revenue share model is not unique. It's not, this is a not, not a unique model to Birmingham. That is, it's a pretty common way. I mean, obviously you can buy the EV chargers outright, but the revenue share model is not. Can you expound on the revenue share model? Yeah, just that it, the vendor is on the hook for the, all the cost of installation. So, you know, the big, the big, the big burden with EV charging is that it costs a lot to install and the capital improvements. You have to upgrade your facilities, then you have to put them in the ground, you have to run the conduit from wherever you want them back to the electrical room. Who's responsible um, for that? So that's, in the revenue share model, they are responsible for that. Okay. So you, we're not buying the units, we're not installing the units, we don't have to run the conduit from the unit to the electrical room. The only thing we were saying that we would be responsible for is bringing the electrical room up to the proper load to support EV charging. Um, they're responsible for 100% of everything else. And not only do they install it, then they're responsible for maintaining it. So if it breaks, they're responsible for coming out and fixing it. We don't call them. They, they're responsible. Well, I mean, we could, but you will. we're not. You'll be calling. Yeah, them. but we're not the ones responsible saying, all right, there's a broken cord. All right, you know, charge point, send me a cord. I got to call the service tech out. And then they're sending us an invoice for a new cord. It's, hey, it's broken. We call them. They come out. They've replaced the cord. It's on their dime. And then they collect 100% of the revenue, and they just give us a portion, a percentage of that revenue back because they absorbed all the fees of the installation and the maintaining of them and operating them, they're just giving a small percentage of the revenue that's collected back in return. So on that, I, at home, I'm paying 18 cents a kilowatt hour in general. I could go lower if I invested in more DT, DTE metering infrastructure that cost me money, but I don't want to invest in that because my, I don't think I've got my payback. So just Plugging in at home, no sp just time of day metering like we're doing now, three to seven, seven to, you know, after seven o'clock. I'm paying 18 cents a kilowatt hour. These guys are talking about 50 cents. So there's a 30, I mean, it's 49, but we'll call it 18, you know, 20 and 30 cents mm -hmm. is what they're making on a kilowatt hour. Um, so you, you know, from a kilowatt hour standpoint at 18 cents, just from for numbers, I'm paying six cents a mile to drive my car. Six cents a mile at 18 cents. So if we're going to triple that, 
I'm not going to triple it, but well, two and a half times six cents. So that's uh, 12. So now I'm paying, you know, 15, 15, let's call it 16 cents a mile. When you, so that's, you know, so the consumer gets pretty smart on this stuff and they're going, you know, I, I, I'm going to go charge somewhere else or I'm going to look for a better deal or I'm going to look for someplace free. If I'm a Tesla person, I'm going to go to a Tesla charger and I got to make sure I got a NACS, North American Connection Standard. And so you got to think about CCS J1772 is the older standard. NACS is the new, um, the, the new adopter that the non-Tesla OEMs are putting in, so you got to be ready for that. But when you're looking at 50 cents, you know, you, you just got to understand what that impact is and versus just charging at home. I'm, and like I said, my number is 18 cents at home, and it's going up. You see DTE. That's another thing you got to think about when DTE yeah. raises their rates. Are we going to, is this 50 going to go to 55? And then, so the, the you know, the EV adopters at, at this stage are pretty, pretty savvy. I think as we go along, people won't care. They just go and plug in and deal with it. But um, you got to understand that. And then from a revenue standpoint, you guys, you know, your systems and different things, you got to say, okay, where is, you got to really understand where is that meter and, and who, who owns that meter. And so if, if, if there's a transformer and there's power coming in and finally comes into the meter, do they own that meter and they're paying that bill? Because if they stop paying that bill because they've got issues or something, now we're in trouble. So then after the meter, it goes to the charger, then there's, you know, all the software and the usage, but somebody's got to write a check to DTE. And so just so you understand That's how the That's why we were works. actually doing that, going to do that. Um, okay. Because to your point, we did, while this is a revenue share model and we want them to absorb all the costs, we do understand that if this didn't go smoothly, because we were looking at this as kind of like a pilot. Let's get our, Yeah. you made the comment like, you know, there was a comment, why don't we install it at multiple garages? We were kind of looking at this, let's get some EVs in the ground, let's see what works, what doesn't work. EV charging stations. EV charging ground. stations yeah. before we say, let's put five here, five here, five here, and then all of a sudden it's like, this was not either the right vendor, this isn't the right experience for us. It's like, let's get our lessons learned at these locations. Um, but to that point, we didn't want to say, "Hey, EV vendor, you're on the if infrastructure. You're on the hook for installing, bringing our infrastructure up." And then after five years, they walk away. Well, the infrastructure's we got to own the infrastructure, meaning the the meter and the transformer. So we want to make sure we are responsible okay. for that. That way, whether it's whoever we're doing now or we we discontinue our agreement and select another person. Okay. That infrastructure is already there, and it's owned by us. Yeah, you own the meter, you yeah. own the invoice too, though. Yep. From DTE, so now you got to figure out, okay, how am I going to get the monies from them? The other thing is, perhaps maybe we think about three instead of twenty, and say, let's let's look at three, let's blow it up, let's crash them, do whatever we got to do, but instead of just jumping into twenty. Well, you could do the infrastructure for 10 and do five or right. something, right? So you have the infrastructure there. If that location really rocks, then you very easily can come back in and add five more. Um, but particularly on this, this lot outside, which is so unique in terms of offering people long-term parking, um, you, you may taking up 10 of those slots might cause some heartburn. I totally agree. I mean, when I go to an event at the Townsend or the community house, I always use that lot because I can be there more than two hours. I don't understand why we're still talking about this. I mean, we don't have a, we don't have a valid proposal for our needs. I think the whole idea behind you talk is to is so you can give right. us some direction in terms of yeah. things that you it's a start. Yeah, to yeah. give us some input as to what you think is important or what other things yeah. that we should be considering as a staff, and then we can take that feedback from you and hopefully, like saying someone said, go do homework or whatever. Yeah, yeah that's exactly what we're going to need to do. And then once we do gather the information, come back to you and say, okay, this is what we're thinking, and we're thinking about putting out another RFP or ITB, but this is our 
the, we're thinking at this point. The other thing is Ford, GM, Hyundai, I think even Nissan now have quote unquote charging networks where they partner with, for example, EVgo and ChargePoint and multiple providers um, and handle the billing through their own apps. So that as like a Ford um, driver, whether I'm a commercial or a retail driver, <clears throat> I can use the, actually the head unit in the vehicle to pay for the charging. Um, so I have plug and charge capability and I have it across multiple networks. I don't need these apps. I don't need a credit card. It's very easy for me to pay <clears throat> one bill across all those networks. And I only noticed one of these is in those the Ford and GM and Hyundai network. The other two are not. I think that should be a consideration because that might um, impact your uptake. You know, if I'm a Ford driver and I don't recognize this and I've got to go figure out how to pay for this and it's another app on my phone, it just becomes a hassle and I go, oh, I'll, I'll charge later. Um, so I think that ought to be another consideration. And I mean, on their websites, they'll tell you who their charge networks are. We can go, I mean, they're adding, they do add providers occasionally. There's, there's a behind the scenes kind of pan industry platform that's running all of that. I have a, another question, because um, we had talked about like doing a pilot program, but I think it was also mentioned that DTE needed to know our vendor before they could upgrade the systems properly. To what degree does the, the DTE upgrade wet us to a specific vendor? None, they just, they need the specifications from the EV company of what they're so like the, the physical changes are all going to be the same, but there's some kind of calibration that is done on a per vendor basis, that sort of thing, or? Yeah. I think it's more along the lines of, depending on what, if we were to put 10 over there, for example, what we had originally proposed, what, if we were to use one of these three vendors, what, what the amount of uh, energy they would need to successfully do that safely and, you know, that kind of thing. So I think they wanted to... They weren't going to put a system in, and then they oh, we we need much more than that, or something along those lines. And I think we would probably want to go a little bit bigger, just in case that you know we. You're assuming you were to yeah. add, add, expand over right. time, but so. but yeah, we did kind of specifically ask we'd like to upgrade the facility first, and then add it. And they were very specific in saying you need to select your vendor, have your vendor contact us. We'll work with them to get the specifications to determine what actually is needed. I think they were looking for, there's a couple of different, you know, speeds of charging out there, and so they probably really need to know that. <clears throat> but actually, we're yeah, not looking yeah. to Level do DC fast chargers. DC fast charging. Yeah. I think that might be the one thing that would really impact them. Yeah, I just didn't want to get us in a situation where we choose a vendor, we have a terrible experience, and then DT's like, well, that's a vendor you chose. we got to go do a whole mess of work again if you want to use a different vendor. Um, I don't think you know, kind of would defeat the purpose of a, a pilot program if actually. I think to Mr. Arpin's point, well, yeah. if we, if and hopefully when we get to that point, we'll have to work with our friends at DTE to make sure that we're doing it mm -hmm. to avoid that circumstance coming on. I mean, yeah. we're learning as we go here too. So, mm -hmm. yeah. do, do we, either the hotels have charging? The Townsend does. Townsend. Sure. I don't think Townsend. Both the Townsend and I believe the Daxon do. But you want, do we know how many? Uh, they're very minimal. Very I, minimal. Think, I think it's. One per. Oh. All right, it might be a dual head, but it's not. Okay. And then, other than the five five, is it the five 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 or the Birmingham? Birmingham, Birmingham, Birmingham place. place. And that that's it in all of Birmingham. That we wow. know. Of. Yeah, that we're. Do we have? Think, oh, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to ask. Do we have data from other municipalities, um, local? You know, other municipalities, smaller cities. Ann Arbor seems like an outlier to me. Um, of how many, if they have electric chargers um, and electric vehicle chargers, and what their use is. I just, you know, 20 to me seems like somewhat of an arbitrary number in, you know, calculating how much use we think we would have. And I'm curious to know, like, what are people in this area of Michigan, you know, how often are they using these chargers? How long are they using these chargers? And I'm wondering if other municipalities, you know, at Royal Oak, for example, um, has them, you know, and what their use data is. So I've reached to out to Park Wright, who's the third-party operator for Royal Oak, to try to get some of that information. I haven't received it yet, but okay. um, hopefully we do. I know 
Uh, yeah, I reached Mara, out to Ferndale. Ferndale. They have. Okay. So, right. yep. They have okay. Ferndale does? Yep. Good. So we're That's going to school, not homework. You go to school first, then you do your homework. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. But do we ever get feedback from the consumers asking, you know, is there charging stations? We, we periodically get questions not, from not people huge. as to why we don't have them. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So not as much not as much as we thought we would. Yeah, get, but that's, I'm I mean, surprised. I think again, it's a uh, as people get more comfortable with the green movement and more comfortable with uh, you know the number of EVs that are you know whether depending on how fast they're actually getting rolled out. But I think I think it's something that's down the line will be more prevalent. But the problem is is not really a problem. But technology changes so fast. Mm -hmm. I mean, we just saw just we were just looking at an article in the free press about a company in California that has this. Where now the charging station is in the pavement. Oh yeah. You drive, drive over the over. top of it. Yeah. It's like a giant magnet. It's inductive charging. Yeah, yeah and induct. Yeah, wireless inductive charging, and it's according to the company, it's one quarter of the current cost, and uh, can be done in, in five times the five times quicker. There's a roadway o in downtown Detroit, Detroit, Detroit that yeah. has that built into it. The vision is someday maybe the roads will all charge yeah. your vehicles. So. I mean, that's one of the reasons we it's came up with the model off. we thought we would. Cause we just didn't want to buy all this stuff and then and be obsolete. Be, be obsolete in six months, right. you know, and it just yeah. didn't want to take that chance. So well, and and also thinking about who uses our parking system, there's two main groups. One is people who work here, and it's not designed for them because they'd have to run out and move the car, and the other is people who are shopping or going to restaurants. And I don't know the numbers, but I don't know how many of them are coming from such a distance that this would even be super relevant. And I think we also have to factor in um, the city's mission when it comes to parking, which is not to make money, but to serve the public, which is why I like the Chester idea, because I don't want to hear from the people about peers taking up spaces that non-EVs want at this time. When it becomes ubiquitous, sure. The in the roadway thing sounds intriguing. I realize it's in the future because it sounds like you could park there whether you were an EV or not. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming it's going to still have charge. There'll be still designated charging spots. Yeah, yeah but, but yeah, yeah, exactly. But maybe far less. Yeah, I think bit. it's impolite to park in an EV charging spot with a non-EV at best, well, and sometimes you, can, you know people have gotten angry about it when they've needed charging and can't get right, to Right, but charger. you've never been in Pierce then when there's no other spaces. Right. Yeah, Would we be ticketing uh, them? I, well, that's they, a very interesting point, because Rochester has, uh, in their new parking decks, they have an EV charging, and it's been a, a source of consternation amongst, yeah. because people go there and they park in their spot all day, and then they want huh. other people want to use it, so they're still dealing with that issue. Mm -hmm. So whether we have to come up with a new ordinance or is that enforceable? Is that the legality of that? I guess that would be a city attorney question. Yeah. But that's an excellent point. I mean, yeah. we haven't crossed that bridge yet either. Yeah. The EV that's chargers, as Jim might know because he drives one, but they, most of these units also have the ability that when somebody's fully charged and you stay on the charger without moving it, it starts charging you additional higher rates. So oh. it says... All right, you're fully charged, but you haven't moved it. They start charging. So, say you're charging 39 cents at the bleak charger. Well, if you have now fully charged and you haven't moved your car, it starts charging you a buck fifty mm -hmm. for whatever the time frame. Yeah, I'm, I'm just making something charge. up, but That's they they generally have that in as a penalty, like an incentive to move your car. Okay. But yeah. I would just say, too... There's you, a phrase for that. I forget what it was called. Some but. information. All the Myers have charging stations now, so it would be interesting to see what kind of feedback they get from that. I mean, that's a pretty big outfit, yeah. yeah. I see these in parking lots all the time, and I, they're very rarely used. I mean, I see, like, one car, and there's, like, a five block of EV charging stations, and there's maybe one car parked in them. I don't know. I mean, that's that's only my Again, I think the intent was this. This was a pilot. Let's, yeah. let's mm -hmm. learn, get some lessons learned, but also then we can say, hey, the city is providing this mm -hmm. as a service versus, you know, how many years down the line, why aren't you providing this? Right. You know, obviously we're not necessarily looking to go above and beyond at this point in time. We were just trying to figure out what works, what doesn't work. So hopefully as this evolves mm -hmm. and becomes more popular, then hopefully we're more educated and can make better decisions then. Did you ever run into the issue of, um, from in a proposal, um, 
that uh, you know we want it. We need to install a minimum of this many chargers to make it profitable. That's for yeah, us. that's an interesting yeah. question. We talk, we, we we did not talk about that because we we put out there the twenty, yeah. but that would be an interesting question. Again, doing our own our school work with, we'll have to figure out whether or not maybe people looked at maybe some didn't because the twenty wasn't enough to make it financially feasible for the right. bigger companies. We don't know. That's some a question, a new question that we've learned that we're going to ask. But to answer your question, nobody specifically yeah. said, spoke to that, yeah. like, hey, this is too many or this is not enough. We really didn't get any feedback from anybody. To Mark's point, maybe it's because we were so specific mm -hmm. with the number, um, but we really didn't get any feedback. If you take a three-mile radius from here, there's seven EV charging specialists around because we're, we're in Detroit. And, and perhaps you, you might consider that putting in, the, in your communications, in Birmingham communications, to say, hey, we're evaluating this. If anybody has any comments, please send an email, whatever. You might get some feedback from some, from some people in, in our neighborhood. Citizens of Birmingham, Troy, who, I don't know who's going to, you know, but just put it out there and see if you get any feedback, <clears throat> considering that we're in the heart of it. public comment on public charging and Birmingham parking facilities. Yeah, I agree. That's a really good idea. Okay. I also think, like, keeping it exclusively in the Chester garage makes more sense, too, from the parking payment standpoint because I think people will get very frustrated if they have to, you know, pull in, pay for the EV charging, and then also pay for parking, um, you know, whereas with the garage, you enter the garage, you know, you pull your ticket, and if you're there for less than two hours, you don't have to pay for parking, but you can still charge your car, and it seems like two hours would be sufficient. I mean, again, I don't really know how, how often people, you know, I, I would be curious to know how many people, you know, just charge overnight and that's enough to get them around, you know, in the area? Um, or how many people actually, you know, do rely on these external, let's say, external away from home charging, like, for full, you know, to charge for longer than, like, an hour? Um, I'd be curious to know. You know, one of the things that we learned before I retired from Ford was that, uh, and I worked on the commercial side, is that, Right away, commercial customers were using public charging way more than they thought they would. They thought they could charge overnight and have sufficient charge for their daily activities. And so um, more and more of them were learning that they needed to top off during the day. Oh, that's so, good to know. So um, that's another consideration is that, you know, more and more commercial vehicles are going to be mm. electrified over time. There aren't a lot of choices yet, but that's going to change. And, you know, is Chester the right spot for them if you've got, I don't know, the elevator repair guy or the HVAC guy in town and he needs to plug in? Um, you know, those will be the kind of people also that are using it. Um, I Chester has the highest clearance. Height I think a lot well. of people end up topping off in, in public settings sometimes because they <clears> run <throat> all day and realize they're running low. Yeah. It's more frequent than you might think. Yeah. What I was sort of wondering, and I think we only, with experience, will learn, is there's a lot of people that work down here. How many of them are really got their little pencil out and have figured out the cost? I, know. I mean, you, you've put a lot of time into it. My experience in talking to customers was they were not that focused on the actual cost um, of operation. And so... I, I wonder how many, you know, Yeah, people. that's what I don't understand. You said it's 16 cents per mile? 18. No, no, no. 18 cents a kilowatt hour. A car gets, on average, three miles per kilowatt hour. Oh, three miles per That would be... On, Five it, cents. It's six cents. 18 six divided cents. by three is six cents per mile to drive. I, that's a, just an average throughout reference number. And so if you're up to 50 cents, you know... Well, that's a big, yeah. From 18 cents. But that's at home, and I could get down to 12 if I invested in more DTE metering infrastructure, and then you got to evaluate a payback on that. And do you set charge timing for middle of the night for lowest rates? Um, no, I, I the way my DTE 
um, service is provided. I believe it's just three to seven. I pay peak, and then I pay the, if this uh, another rate after from seven till three the next day. I only have, but there's various DTE services that are available depending on your usage. Yeah, so most, many EVs, and I think in the future all, will have the ability for the, the individual to set charge timing to try to minimize the use and, all, and, and the stress on the grid and all of that. Yeah, vehicle software will is yeah. constantly evolving. But I, I do think what would be interesting, Chester is likely to get a lot of um, use by people who work down here. Um, and they will want to charge longer, possibly. They may not all be doing the math. They choose convenience, right? Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a trade-off, convenience. Well, the, I was actually, that actually reminded me. Um, so you had said that there's some functionality to sort of penalize people for leaving their car in a charging port longer than they charge. But if somebody, like, shows up to work at 9 in the morning at Chester and plugs in, I mean, we're not seriously expecting them to, like, come out at lunchtime and move their car, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Like, they're just going to be there for eight or nine hours. Are we, was the intent to, I think like, that's how, does, how does that work? Is it just, like, with basically the first however many people with EVs that show up get the spots? And it really goes to, yes, it's, it's, that's how it typically yeah. works. And that's where, it's I mean, EV you've heard the fist right? fights that really happen on the over EV the plug, right? <laughs> no. Yeah. So what's you'll, your you'll learn a lot about behaviors with three. You'll see. But I mean, I think that gets to the point, is, I guess, one, yes, but two, I mean, you kind of talked about EV politeness, right? Like, I think it's kind of on the EV drivers, it's kind of the un... I mean, yeah, people I mean, abuse it, but I mean, I think that's also kind of like, if you're an EV driver and you're abusing it, it's kind of uh, in, a no-no. In, in, in a nice day that's not snowing or raining, I would expect someone who's working down here to probably come and move their car at lunch, right? Um, but my, my question was mostly, are we, the, the intent was to do some kind of rate hike, do something to try to encourage people to vacate those spots after their car is finished charging. Yeah, but I, even I'm, if, I, even if we are expecting them to just like move it three spots over and repark. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I don't. Whether that's our parking enforcement that. or that's the EV charging yeah, company yeah, yeah. saying we're building in these rate hikes. Sure, but when somebody but doesn't. Not is we're not going to say, yeah, we expect you to show up in the morning, park in the EV charging spot, plug your car in, and leave it there all day. We're we're cool with that. We're not saying that. No. We're saying no. This is if you, if you're going to charge, you need to Follow the rules you need to plan on moving your car once you're done charging. Yeah. Yeah. And I think there's there's from our understanding like you've already talked about, there's penalty. I mean, the EV people themselves realize people may want to do that, so they build into that system, hey, Some. It, it, okay, well, we'll I, don't I guess one of the other consideration, yeah. hey, if you stay longer than, you know, you're charged, you're, you're going to pay for that spot then. Okay. I mean, if it became an issue, I think we could make it clear that those spots in the Chester lot are four-hour max or something so that, you, you know, you could communicate that you can't sit here all day. Yeah. If it became, you know. So I'm just looking. In summary, where, where are we headed? <laughs> are we are we in a wait and see or? I, I think that's we'll, what it, I think we, what we'll do is we're yeah. gonna we're gonna do some some schoolwork, school homework yeah. for you, and, and we'll come up with what we think is we'll get some examples. Some so things yeah, that we're we not like. rushing into this. No, yes. no, no. no, okay, no. I think I think our goal is to do another RFP that's, and see what see if we maybe get something more similar because again I don't think we want to be well maybe like. We want to do our homework, whether it's a revenue share model or we buy them. But to Mark's point, we want to do our homework. But I think the goal is eventually to come back to the committee with it's another. It's a lot more complicated than another proposal. You know, another consideration that the city takes. You know, if if in fact the city, you know, we we have a lot of city vehicles. You know, right now we have the we have one one, e, one EV. Yeah. But if we then set up a structure, uh, 10, 10 charging stations at Chester. Well, maybe we can get more city vehicles. That sit then overnight. Would make, yeah, that would could charge off hours yeah. at a reduced rate, and then city staff could come in in the morning and go pick those cars up, and they'll be ready to go for the day. And and an EV charging because we don't have anywhere else in the city public property that is has, so might be a, a win win for the city yeah, so too. The police cars, police switch cars, over right. That's no, be a code big, enforcement, yeah. all, you know, inspectors, yeah. Yeah. you know, building officials, engineers. They all have you know, they all use city vehicles during the yeah. day. You know, so. Those so all, it, a lot of those are ideal use cases for conversion too, because you're not doing very many miles a day. 
At uh, 220 volts, 50 amps, it's 11, it's 11 kilowatts um, on a level two charger. 11 kilowatts will get you roughly about 30, 30 miles of charge per hour. So if that person rolls up in the morning and has 90, it says to 90 miles left uh, or 90 miles to, to a full charge, then they're on there for three hours, just throwing out rough numbers. The next guy pulls in, he could be on complete empty. His capacity might be, let's say, 240 miles. Then he's going to be on for eight hours. Eight times 30 is 240. So that person sits there for eight hours and gets a full charge. The other one is sitting there for three hours. Well, he's got to know, he or she driving up, says, oh, I better come out here in three or four hours, but I got a meeting scheduled. So I'm just going to leave it or forget, or I forgot. So there's all that going on. The use cases vary. But in, in your planning and thinking purposes, max, depending on, on how the DTE infrastructure is set up, you're looking at about 30 miles in an hour is on a level two charger. And then as, as batteries get more efficient, then that number will go up, hopefully. Okay. So that's, that's your number when you're coming in. And, and so that's when you're plugging in overnight, those guys come in at five, five o'clock, eight hours. You know, the, the and that is something to consider morning. that I know, I'm not sure if all of them had it, but I know some of them do, is they'll notify you when you are fully charged. Sure. So to your point, I don't want to do the math, but I do know some of these do send you alerts saying, hey, your vehicle's fully charged, so you you don't have to sit there and do the math. You can be like, oh, i got to go out and move it. But to your point, you might be busy. You can't go out, but, you know, if you find out you're fully charged at 11, 11 o'clock in the morning, you could go out at lunch and move it. In the old days, we just went to a gas station. <laughs> right. <laughs> New times. <laughs> Thank you so, for the input. Appreciate it. So I was going to kind of move us on in a related way. Um, do we have, uh, like, if, if, we, if we come back and we decide we do want to put it in a lot somewhere, um, do we have meter usage stats we can get? This is kind of moving into the parking data part of the discussion, um, but I think that that would be interesting to know is like what is uh, the utilization for some of these metered lots if that's where we're thinking about putting one of these things. Sort of, because we took the sensors out, you don't necessarily get occupancy data, however we can pull information based off of, off of revenue, you know, number of transactions. The, the meters don't keep track of here's when there was time on the meter, and then I ran out at this time, and then somebody put money in again an hour later, and then that was good. I like, can't we don't specifically that. say that meter out there is 80% used, utilized. I can't do that, but we can pull number of transactions or revenue based off of revenue generated. So obviously, the more popular zones are going to make more money. So we can probably roughly come to what you're asking for. It just is not going to be as simple as just pulling occupancy data. Is that? But we should be able to probably find out what you're looking. So if you're saying, hey, is lot seven the right place? Or maybe lot six, we're kind of where Al works, or mm -hmm. someplace south, like we should be able to probably get to what you're asking. Okay. That's where you were going with it? Like, yeah, that's where I was going to say. Right. Well, and in general, you know, we're talking about, you know, I think whenever we did, we're discussing this thing, these things, you know, and, and I had pointed this out to you uh, in an email earlier. Um, you know, we're still, we still don't have great parking data here, and we're trying to make decisions about, oh, like, can we afford to take 10 spots from such and such a garage? But we don't really know what the occupancy in these garages is right now. Um, and it's really making a lot of this decision making extremely difficult. Um, so kind of like, what, what is the plan to get us to having really good parking data in the garages, because I, I, it's been a while at this point. I know the software has been a huge pain in the butt, but like, do, do we need to reach out to them, to the software vendor, and say, you need to make this easier for us? 
do we need, is there some training that needs to happen because this is, it's starting to, I think, impede our ability to do decision making here? Are you talking about the garages or the meters? I mean, the garages is the, is the data we have right now, and it's not accurate, as far as I can tell. Um, the, the meters, it sounds like we, we can't get really granular data for, but we can get some kind of, here's how many hours people paid for parking in meters in such and such a lot. It sounds like that's possible. Um, just take the revenue, divide by the price per hour or something, right? Right. Um, but but I'm not even talking about that. I'm just saying the, the the data we have for the garages right now does not seem accurate to me. Um, and I know that we've had a lot of issues. The software it makes it really obnoxious to try to do a manual entry, which we need to do because we have the gate arms open on Sundays. Um, but like it's it's starting to get really difficult to. Um, to make decisions about should we take 10 spots out of Chester or Pierce or Park or something when do these garages fill up, you know, at what time do they fill up, we don't really know. And I think that's making things really difficult. So is, it, is there something we can do to get ourselves to having solid data here? Yeah. So yes, we obviously need to continue to work to drive that down. However, I will say like, in general, the, the hourly occupancy report you're referring to, while it's not 100% accurate, I will say that, you know, we highlight when is the high, high, you know, the peak usage. Generally, that's pretty darn close. Now, obviously, you can argue, is it 100%? No, it's not 100%. Meaning, like, but we can identify, like, the hour, you know, I generally, on those reports, I highlight in yellow where is, like, the highest usage of the, of the day. It's sure. That's, I mean, that's pretty much, that's pretty accurate. And then I, you know, are you, sorry, are you saying that number is accurate or that time of day is accurate? That time of day. So that percentage might not be, might not be as accurate as we want it to be, but it's close. I mean, it's whether, if it says it's 98% full, it might be 90% full or 88. But generally, you could say we are confident that that percentage at that time of day is the highest usage. So, I mean, obviously our issue is setting the first time of day. You know, we, we talk about, we've talked about many times, is like setting that first, the, the counts in the morning is the most imperative thing because otherwise if it's, if we don't get the time set, if we don't get the count set right at the beginning of the day, then they're off the rest of the day. But generally, as a rule of thumb, even if the count is 100% accurate at seven in the morning when they're doing their counts, it still ramps up that that when we're identifying the peak time of day, that number should be darn close. So, so you're saying we, you think you like like I I understand that like and like I'm comfortable with the idea that yeah Wednesday at noon is always <laughs> when when the garages are the most full, but I'm not confident that that the numbers are accurate. I mean the like the February numbers we have in in the printout here say that there were. Uh, let me look at it. It's a big table. Um, say that there were 573 transients in Chester. Like, there's just no way that that's true. Right. No, I. I understand. Right. Like, like not like off by two percent. Right. Like this is off by like several orders of magnitude. Right. So is there? Is, is there some is there strategy to get this done? So we've identified, we're trying to determine if it's a reporting issue or if it's a manual issue. Okay. So what we found is if you do the counts at, so we have a person that comes in in the morning, his job is to come around, do the counts, set the counts at the first thing in the morning. However, we found that they basically said, if you come through, you do your counts at 650, but you come in and you adjust the counts at 705, you'll adjust the counts at 705, but then it starts, it doesn't, the report's not gonna show what that count is at seven o'clock hour. So it basically, if you adjust the counts at 705, it's gonna start counting right then. So if you start at, if there's five cars in the lot and you adjusted it then, then it's going to start adding out. So it's six cars, seven cars, and then at eight o'clock, it's going to show you, it's not going to say at seven o'clock you started with five cars because you input it at 705. 
So it's going to say at 7 to 5 you started with 5 cars and then however many cars came in after that and then it's going to show you the new number at 8 o'clock. Well, if you have hundreds of cars that come in between 7 to 5 and 8 o'clock, 200 cars, it's going to show, show 200 cars. So, you know, you might, you know, the gate arms go up Saturday, you know, Saturday night into Sunday morning if you had 200 cars in the garage when the gate arms went up. That number is going to stay 200 all the way through Sunday, all the way through 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock, 6 o'clock in the morning on Monday until we update the counts. And then if you had 300 cars come in the garage between 7 in the morning and 8 in the morning, you might not see that number go down because that many cars came in. So we're trying to figure out what is a software issue or what is, hey, we're counting the cars, and by the time we <coughs> input the number, they've gone back up. I still agree with you, Kevin, that I don't think they're... I don't think they're accurate. Okay. But I, I, to answer your question, I I'm mean, trying to determine is it a us issue or is it a software issue? Okay. Good. As long as we're, we're clear that, that, yeah, some of this stuff needs to be cleaned up. Because, yeah, like I said, you know, we're talking about is it okay to remove 10 spots from a garage? Well, this is precisely, right, how occupied do the garages get is precisely the piece of data we need to make that decision. Um, so if we don't have it, we're just kind of, you know, putting our, our finger in the wind here trying to guess, um, which we shouldn't have to do, right? Like, Are we, we really have these machines keeping track of these numbers Taking numbers space it's away. Addition. That's it. <laughs> the, the only thing I, I, I challenge on is, are we really taking space away? Because those EVs are parking in the garage anyway, right? They have to park somewhere. Today. Sure, but I mean, I, I thought you had said that uh, you were dubious about putting the EV charging stations in outside, lot seven. Outside, outside, because the the outside lot is such a unique spot. But it's, it's not, not a garage. It, I I understand, but I'm saying isn't the philosophy the same? You're saying like I could make the same argument. Well, well there's going to be EV people parking in the parking lot, so isn't that parking for them? Right. I mean, either you you say this EV is is these EV spots are potentially taking parking away from ICE people who need them, or you're saying, no, there's probably enough EV demand that these spots will get filled up and parkers are parkers, so it doesn't matter, right? I think generally that's true. Um, I'm just saying that that particular lot is very distinctive from all of the other parking scenarios in town. Okay, and, and it would have been a larger percentage of that lot, a yes. much larger percentage, um, and so that should be considered, but yeah, anyway. If, if it were one or two spots in that lot, you know, if, as a percent of the total capacity of that lot, it's huge. Ten spots as a percent of the total Chester capacity is, you know, yeah, is single nothing. digit percent. I think we'll get a lot of blowback from that lot seven when, you know, parkers come in for the first time and see that they can't, you know, park, they there. can't park there and that there are ten open spots that are all marked EV, EV only spots, I think. It's going to be. It's very visible. Yes, very visible. I agree with you. Yep. It's right in the middle of Birmingham. Like you said, people use those spots for events. I mean, there are two, you know, event venues that are right there. Um, I agree. I think it's, from a visibility standpoint, it's maybe not our best. Um, so are point. we transitioning to other topics, or are we done with these? I think we got... So I, I have a question as a follow-up to the last meeting that kind of occurred to me as I was uh, leaving. And that was we had the, um, and I forget the individual's name who was here talking about the financial, going through the financials, which was a really great review. Um, and he had mentioned that when the city was contemplating the construction and the you know the de demolition and the movement of the parking garage over um, on Woodward, that they did the financial analysis and that you know he he intimated but didn't provide specifics that you know with um, a bond issue and the cost to build that garage and the revenue it it wasn't a very good financial proposition. Is that data still available for the committee to look at? Because I think that was your question, you know, what what if we had to replace one? What would that be look like economically? And it occurred to me that I think they've done that analysis, at least at this point in time, and it's a point in time analysis. Um, but it would be just helpful and a time saver if we could just dust that off and make sure we're all knowledgeable about what's in that analysis. We can ask. Thank you. I had a question then about um, 
just a clarification on the free parking report page. Um, this is the, the cash revenue column there. That's uh, just transient revenue, right? That's not monthly? Or is that the total revenue generated by each garage? This cash revenue generated from transient only. Okay. Not monthly. Okay, so the, and, and the total cars similarly are transient parking cars? Correct. Okay. That's what I figured. I just wanted to make sure. Do you <coughs> publish the monthly stats? As well, or is that something just, we can just get at this in the meeting? Future? Just at this meeting. <coughs> it's interesting. Sorry, yeah. I was I'm not sure I follow. <coughs> I, I, I thought Michelle was asking. Yeah, do where we is have the monthly, similar do we have monthly table revenue for monthly numbers? Yeah, by garage. Oh, these are the only reports that we currently publish, so we don't have the monthly. I guess we're not sharing specific monthly data. We can include that. I think would help us fun. understand capacity yeah. and total revenue. I don't know if we need it every month, but it would be nice to have. I mean, you have the. Snapshot. Sorry, I'm trying to find the report. Um, I mean, obviously, the you have the monthly, the occupancy report, which shows you the monthly passes used. But as far as like monthly sales, like here's how many monthly passes we've sold in the subsequent revenue that we have not included in here, but we can include that. Yeah. Okay. Once again, I mean, it's probably going to be exactly the same month to month, so we probably don't need to see it every single month, but it would be... Do you know by garage? Unless it's not the same month to month. Well, no, it'll, to your point, because we have wait lists at, at Pierce, Peabody, and Park, in theory, those won't change much, but, you know, Park, or I'm sorry, Chester and uh, Old Woodward, you might see it go up and down a little bit. But to your point, okay. yeah, you're probably not going to see massive swings. One That's interesting, yeah. Because those two garages don't have don't have wait lists, so I mean you might see you might see it go up and down, but to your point, you're not going to see massive swings. On this free parking report, you have a column that says rate per. It's rate per what? In the far right column, I'd assume those rate per vehicle. Yeah, per vehicle. Yeah, okay. because obviously we have a rate band of whether it's Obviously, there's the free cars, but then you have two dollars all the way up through ten dollars. So it's kind of what your average ticket price is per vehicle. Gotcha. And how, how does Peabody get the most cars? It's the smallest structure. A lot of churn, I guess. Yeah, they turn over there because of the powerhouse gym and Max Brock Realty over there. They just so they don't have as many monthly park passes. It's it's the monthlies are capped over there. I mean because okay. of the small, but it, it's the daily turnover. It's in the end because of the movie theater um, at night too. Oh, I was gonna say okay, because I'm surprised. I would have thought Pierce yeah. would be the, the most. Active. Pierce in the coffee shop. It really isn't. You can yeah, actually also too. look the the rate per the rate per car right. at Peabody is is a tiny amount compared to the others, so people must be really, yeah. you know, is like Power average there for like two four, hours. Yeah. yeah, well, they just be gone. I, I assume the rate per doesn't include the free parkers, does it? No. Yeah, so, no, but so these are people, point, so it's, it's like people are staying about four hours at Peabody, whereas at Pierce, it's like a lot of people, they're just there all day. That's what I was going to say, yeah, that, so that's, it has the least amount of turnover now. Mm -hmm. Wow. I guess that's why there's a wait list for the, for the month. <laughs> Do we want to move on to uh, review any parking reports that you have? Well, that's that's kind of what I yeah, that's kind of what <laughs> I kind of jumped the gun there. Sorry. Any anything else you want to add, Aaron? Do they know any and Um, no, I just yeah. anything. Uh, anybody have anything for the next item? Which one? Uh, I think we're at what items not on the agenda. Is there anything to be presented? Um, How are we doing on the cleanup on the decks, spring cleaning, power washing, or things? Uh, well, we haven't turned the water back on yet. Yeah, still, okay. no, not yet. But <coughs> but the staff. So obviously, we still have one open maintenance position to fill right now. Um, the position is closed, so the HR department is just scheduling interviews. Once we fill that position, our maintenance department will be fully formed. Um, actually don't know if everyone's met, but uh, we have two of our colleagues here today. 
Um, everyone's probably met <laughs> Annie because she used to work with SB Plus and has since come over with to the city. And then we have Wendy. Wendy is uh, uh, was recently hired, so she just started a few weeks. Uh, has it been a month? It's been close to a month. Close so, a month. Um, but she's been a very welcome addition to the team. So. Please meet Annie and Wendy. <laughs> Welcome. Welcome. Thank you. And how about the lighting? Have you had any more feedback? No more feedback yet. Um, obviously, the the Chester garage, when they get to that part, when we get... Um, so the next step for the Chester garage repairs is we're putting together the RFP for the repairs, and then that'll go out... Um, the intent is that that RFP will actually get posted here in the next week. Um, if we follow the dates, then the bids would be due in sometime in early May, but the lighting decisions wouldn't be made until the vendor is selected to do the repairs and they get down there. So we're a little bit of ways away, but these were obviously options that we were just trying to consider. So when they get to that point, it's a quicker decision. Uh, Aaron, do you want to make any comment about um uh, committee members uh, making public comment on issues that have been brought up uh, in front of the committee but not discussed and agreed upon? Um, so, I'm not sure, Jim, do you want to bring your items up at today's I, meeting for a discussion with the uh, I, APC or not? Um, I can. I think we're going to address them next, in the next meeting as well when we have um, WJE presenting, um, but we should talk about the fact that we're on the agenda for this Monday's uh, commission meeting, so we're going to need some attendance there. If you want to, however you want to bring sure. the so fact that I So at Monday, at the that, last commission uh, meeting, um, the letter that, you, that the APC drafted was presented to the City Commission, and the City Commission has a three-step process to get things um, discussed. So last meeting was step two, meaning it needs to be, uh, it was added as an agenda item for this upcoming meeting. So at our next City Commission meeting, which is Monday, April 8th, um, the City Commission will openly discuss the letter that was drafted. Um, so yeah, I guess if you would like to attend, you can either do so in person or you're welcome to join via via Zoom, but they are going to discuss just that letter. Is that last on the agenda again? Well, we it's, waited. It's, it's, under, it's new under new business. business yeah. It's under new business. So that is, you have consent? Yeah. Um, and then it's new business. Okay. So it'll be before, last time it was under communications, which was the last. actually toward the end. Yeah. Okay. We, were, we were there till midnight. Yeah, we were there for a long time. I know. <laughs> but if you... But if anybody can make it, I, I'd like to attend, but I can't make it. I'm going to be out of town on April 8th. So hopefully between... I the, should be back, but yeah, I'm flying in that afternoon. Okay. Uh, the, the, the point I was actually trying to make was that if, if you're making anybody here, if, if they're making a, um, any kind of comment about parking, you have to really uh, identify whether you're making it um, as an individual or whether you're representing the committee. Right. Uh, there was a little bit of confusion at the last city commission meeting, and maybe there was, there was an email sent. I, I was CC'd on it. Um, I didn't get the attachments for some reason, uh, but it, it went to Jana, and um, it, it was something that um, the, the committee discussed, but we hadn't agreed uh, upon, uh, and maybe it was presented as something that the committee thought uh, uh, that was uh, something that the committee had agreed upon, but we haven't made any, con you know, consensus on it. So I think you, if you if you're going to speak, um, you know, identify whether I'm speaking as an individual or I'm representing the the ideas of the committee. Just to make things clear. Correct. Right. You are correct. Not the <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? Is uh, WG coming next meeting? Yeah, so um, 
if we wanted, uh, we can discuss it briefly. At the past meeting, uh, when Finance Director Gerber was talking, there it, the committee expressed, um, you know, desire to have to get a little more update on the status of the garages with the re ongoing repairs, where we're at, um, this, you know. How, what kind of condition the garage is in. Obviously, we provided you the structural assessments. The intent was that WJE was actually going to attend this meeting, um, but because of the, we thought it was uh, imperative to get the EV charging up here because we um, thought that, you know, because of the, the, the pending bids and the response that we got from the bidders, we wanted to um, bring resolution to this topic first. So we'll have WJ, representatives from WJE attend the May meeting and they can speak to the structural assessments that we provided you. And obviously they'll talk more specifically about what they believe the condition of the garages in, are in um, and how they plan to address them moving forward. And if you guys have any additional, additional questions um, for them, they can answer those there, but they will be at the May meeting. Do we have a estimate of who's going to be there on April 8th? Michelle, you said you might. Okay, that's yeah, I one. I think I can make it. I don't have a oh, Yeah, I can probably go. That's two. Unless, like all my other flights Three. in the okay. last month, it's late. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No. Oh, April 8th? I won't be able to be there. Okay. Well, we might have three. That's good. I'll give you a chance to hear what they have to say um, what what staff and the commission has to say about this committee and then you'll have a chance to speak or at least hear them in person I'm going to try to log in from zoom but I'll be I'm in transition traveling okay Anybody else have any other issues to bring up? I think we're good. Meeting adjourned. Thank you all for coming.